Okay, I'll tell you about enema. Uh, enema is a technique which is based on signals which come from magnetic nuclei. So every atom has a nucleus, but uh, some atoms have nuclei which have the property of what is called nuclear spin. And nuclear spin is something that clearly you it comes from physics, it is an intrinsic property of the nucleus and the spin itself is described by uh, a quantum number and the quantum numbers for example can be i can be 0 which means it does not have a spin that means it is a non-magnetic nucleus or it can be half, 3 halves, 5 halves or so forth or it can be 1 two, three. So, spin is a property, it is an intrinsic property of an atomic nucleus. It is either got a value half integral or integral. So, these are integral spins, these are half integral spins. Now, if you are studying biology, what you really want to do is you want to study molecules by getting some kind of signal to emerge from the atoms which constitute the molecule. So, suppose you have a molecule you would like to get some signal from this atom or some signal from this atom or some signal from this atom. What are the atoms in biological molecules? They are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, sulphur, phosphorus. There may be few other elements, but we will not worry about them. Now, if you take these, carbon has the isotope C12. Yeah. Now, carbon 12 has i is equal to 0, that means it has no spin. Carbon 13 has spin i is equal to half. Hydrogen, the hydrogen isotope hydrogen 1, has spin i is equal to half. So, these are what we would call magnetic nuclei. This is now uh, not a magnetically active nucleus. But what is the natural abundance of carbon? The natural abundance of carbon is this now is 99.8 percent maybe or 90, I think it is 98.9 percent and this is 1.1 percent. So, all these carbon nuclei are silent now in NMR whereas you can get signals out of uh, the carbon 13 isotope. Whereas for hydrogen, this is about 99.8 percent abundant. So, hydrogen is a very abundant magnetically active nucleus. But now we will ask the question, suppose I take a glass of water and I put this glass of water in uh, a magnetic field, I will now have water molecules OH, OH. So, there are hydrogens, the oxygen. What is the isotope of oxygen? Oxygen is oxygen 16 this has i is equal to 0. So, that is the abundant uh, oxygen isotope. Whereas, the hydrogens now have a magnetic property associated with it. That is they have a nuclear magnetic moment and because they have a nuclear magnetic moment, suppose I have a magnetic field pointing along that direction and the nucleus now has a magnetic moment that means the nucleus has a spin. That spin number is what we call spin of half. So, a magnetic moment in physics is a vector quantity. That means you can draw an arrow and it has got a direction. Now, if you place a glass of water in a magnetic field, all those hydrogen atoms which are there, or they are going to have nuclei with spin half. Those nuclei with spin half, because it has got a magnetic moment, what will the magnetic moment do in a magnetic field? Once you put magnetic moments in a magnetic field, especially if you have a spinning moment, it will now precess about the field direction. It will go like this, keep on going. This precession, this is what the physicists call this precession. This precession will be with a frequency which is called the Lama frequency and this is omega. So, that means you will have this precess round and round. Now, this precessing frequency 
will depend on the strength of the magnetic field that you have applied and there will be a constant of proportionality which is gamma which is the magnetogyric ratio which is the ratio of the magnetic moment gamma is equal to the magnetic moment of the nucleus divided by its angular moment. These are all nuclear quantities so you do not have to worry about them they are fixed nature has fixed them. This is called the Larmor equation what this tells you is that if you apply a higher and higher magnetic field what will happen is these vectors are going to precess faster and faster. Normally what you would imagine is that uh, if you apply the magnetic field the magnet will now uh, get oriented but these are now like little spinning magnets. So since they are like little spinning magnets it is the precessional frequency which will increase that is why you will find that NMR spectrometers sometimes are described by the frequency of the spectrometer you will say there is a 300 megahertz spectrometer or a 500 megahertz spectrometer that is where the frequency comes from. But what will a mag magnet do it can align with the field or it can align uh, against the field so there are two possible orientations. So if you have a spin of half this is what we would call the plus half orientation this is what we would call the minus half orientation. So then in terms which you can easily understand you will have two energy levels because each of these will be associated with the energy level one will be the plus half orientation the other will be the minus half orientation the very small and now if you you can apply the condition which is through all of spectroscopy if the energy difference is related to the frequency of radiation that you sign on it you can cause a transition this new now lies in the radio frequency region this is radio frequency that is why you get this 100 megahertz 200 megahertz 300 megahertz nowadays you do not listen to the radio but uh, very much but in the old days when we had radios you will be tuning to a frequency some station comes at 25 megahertz so everybody was familiar with megahertz but megahertz really means the processional frequency 100 megahertz means 100 million times per second 1 hertz is 1 time per second 100 megahertz 1 megahertz is 1000 times and uh, it will go round and round. So if you sign radio frequency radiation now the nuclear spin system will absorb this energy and that is what we call nuclear magnetic resonance absorption. So it is just a form of spectroscopy spectroscopy is all about transitions between discrete states and uh, in this particular case the discrete states are nuclear levels and you cause ra irradiate radio frequency radiation on it and you will cause this transition. Now depending upon where the hydrogen atom is in the molecule the frequency of absorption will now be different. This is because what are molecules? Molecules are atoms connected together and there are electrons between them. One electron is magnetic but if you have a paired electrons it is now diamagnetic because you have cancelled out the spins. So there is a lot of diamagnetic electron cloud in molecules and what happens to this diamagnetic electron cloud when you put it in a magnetic field there is an old uh, principle uh, 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 which is there or call in physics called Lenz's law where if you place a diamagnetic substance in a magnetic field you will get an induced magnetic field which will oppose the direction of the magnetic field. You apply a stronger magnetic field it will oppose it uh, even more. The result of this is that because of these electrons these nuclei do not feel the field that you apply but they feel a slightly lesser field they are shielded. So this is what in NMR spectroscopy is called shielding. The extent of the shielding depends upon where the hydrogen atom is in the molecule and therefore all hydrogen atoms in molecules do not have the same absorption frequency. Okay. So you look at this equation here omega is equal to gamma h0 this is a constant this is the strength of the applied magnetic field that you apply in the lab. So if you have more money you can buy a bigger uh, magnet 
And now if you place your sample, the so-called Lama processional frequency depends upon the strength of the magnetic field. And therefore the higher the magnetic field, the greater will be the processional frequency. That processional frequency is also what you call the resonance frequency. That is where the term resonance comes from because it is at resonance that you have this resonant absorption. Actually resonance is a phenomenon in which you will flip this there and you will flip this one over here. That is both upward and downward transitions will be caused. See nuclear levels are spaced by very little. So at uh, normal temperatures and so on, the upper level is almost as populated as the lower level. And therefore, there is very little net energy difference, net population difference between the plus half and minus half states. This is why NMR is not a very sensitive phenomenon. Uh, unlike uh, vibrational spectroscopy, where transitions between vibrational levels, see for example, Raman spectroscopy, which we are celebrating today, is uh, transitions between vibrational levels. Vibrational levels are a fundamental property of the molecule. Whereas the separation between NMR levels is not a fundamental property of the molecule. It depends upon your experimental field. This is the strength of the NMR method. That is why as you go to bigger and bigger magnets, larger and larger magnetic fields, you increase the separation. But I was telling you about shielding. But because of the shielding, different hydrogen atoms in different parts of the molecule will be shielded to different extents. This is why you get a spectrum. So if you then have uh, intensity along this axis and frequency along this axis, you will get a spectrum, you will get different lines. So if you have 10 hydrogen atoms in your molecule which are different, you might get 10 resonance frequencies. That is the power of the method. It spreads atoms based on signals from their nuclei on the basis of their chemical environment. This separation in frequencies is what one calls the chemical shift. Now you can see that this separation can be increased in frequency units by increasing the magnetic field strength. So this is why NMR frequency differences are sometimes normalized and we talk about differences between lines in parts per million. Whereas if we talked about it in terms of simple frequencies, then of course if you increase the magnetic field, you will get a greater separation between the lines. That is why today if you spend more and more money getting more and more powerful spectrometers, your spectral dispersion will increase. I will not use the term resolution because resolution actually means the width of the line that you actually de determine, but the dispersion between the lines will increase. So if you take today uh, a 500 megahertz spectrometer, that will show you a greater dispersion than for example a 300 megahertz spectrometer. If you have 800 megahertz spectrometer, overlapping lines can now be resolved. This cannot be done in any other form of spectroscopy. UV, whether it is recorded on your machine or my machine, the UV spectrum should remain the same. The infrared spectrum should remain the same. But the NMR spectrum in its appearance, in its dispersion will differ. So that is why NMR is so important. But if you look at biology which you are interested in, you can also today look at carbon-13 because only carbon-13 is active. The rest of it is silent. Although the abundance is 1.1 percent today, the uh, sensitivity of modern methods is such that this can be easily measured. So today one can measure carbon-13, hydrogen quite well. We also one more isotope which is very important for biologists is nitrogen-15. Natural abundance of nitrogen-15 is very small, but you can enrich samples with nitrogen-15. I will turn now to biology. If you take proteins or nucleic acids, uh, you can get signals from phosphorus, you can get signals from carbon, you can get signals from hydrogen. And nowadays you can get signals from nitrogen because what you do is you uh, clone a gene, put it into an expression vector, transform E. coli, uh, introduce the gene into E. coli and then grow the bacterium now in minimal medium. 
and in minimal medium you supplement it with carbon 13 labeled glucose and nitrogen 15 labeled ammonium chloride. These are the sole sources of nitrogen and carbon that you give the bacterium. The result then would be that all the carbon atoms in the molecule will be labeled with carbon 13 and all the nitrogen atoms will be labeled with uh, nitrogen 15. So now you have abundant signals to see. The more signals you have, the more frequencies you get, the greater the resolution of the structure that you determine. So that in brief is uh, the importance of NMR and why you might take some interest in uh, looking at it. I can turn to another method if you want and I would say the method that I will tell you about because uh, it is I think very much more current and much more powerful is mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry is a somewhat simpler technique than NMR in many ways because to really understand NMR you know, need to know a little bit of physics, you know to know considerable amount of chemistry and you need to know something about nuclear interactions. But mass spectrometry is absolutely straightforward because all you are doing is you are measuring the mass of the molecule and the way you are measuring the mass of the molecule is to take a molecule and then you ionize the molecule. And you ionize the molecule and you will put a positive charge on it. After that you will detect the mass to charge ratio. This is what you detect. And one can ask the question how do you ionize molecules? One way of ionizing a molecule is to hit the molecule with electrons and in which case an electron might get ejected. Then you will get m plus because one electron has been knocked out. This is what is called uh, electron impact ionization. So the first step is to ionize and one way of doing it is electron impact but this would have been of no use to biology because uh, it is a gas mass spectrometry is a gas phase measurement. So everything you measure in the gas phase. And in order to get something into the gas phase, you have to heat it. And otherwise, you have to apply very high vacuum. And if you apply very high vacuum, the vacuum will leak. And then you will fix leaks all the time on mass spectrometers. But maybe towards the end of the 1980s, this technique was invented called electrospray ionization. This was done by John Fenn uh, in the US. And this was a marvelous method in which you had a spraying liquid just like you get out of your HPLC or something coming out. You sprayed it under the influence of an electric field and little droplets came out. What did these little droplets contain? They contained the sol solvent and they also contained the solute. So there would be if you were studying proteins, there would be small protein molecules over here. These are now in the gas phase. Now what you do is in a perpendicular direction, you put nitrogen gas. You get some gas inserted in. You can heat this nitrogen gas a little bit. Now when the nitrogen gas impinges on these bubbles, little droplets, the water will evaporate. As the water evaporates, the droplets will become smaller and smaller and smaller. Once they become smaller and smaller, you suddenly at some point, you will have what is called a Coulomb explosion. This is because the charged molecules, protein charged molecules, they are coming very close to one another and now they just repel one another and explode. So you now have naked protein molecules in the gas phase and you can measure the mass to charge ratio. So you can measure their mass. The accuracy here is very high. So today you can measure masses to about plus or minus 1 Dalton without a problem at very large masses but with very small molecules you can actually measure to 0, 0, 001 Dalton. So mass accuracy is very high in uh, mass spectrometry and 
today's technology of electrospray ionization or laser desorption, size is not a criterion. Any size can go into the gas phase. So there are studies now where the ribosome has been determined in the gas phase. So a mass of 2.1 million Daltons determined and if one subunit falls off, you get a slight reduction in mass. By looking at this, you can find out what is the difference. Today you can study post-translational modification, you can sequence uh, and after ionization, the second step would be to fragment, fragmentation. So this is step 2, this ionization is step 1. After you have got a molecule in the gas phase and it is charged, now if you give it some more energy, it will break, you will get pieces, you will measure the mass to charge ratio of those pieces. Then you can actually collect the piece and break it again and because there are devices which are called ion traps. This the physicists discovered in the 1980s, now they are found in mass spectrometer but the ion trap is a very simple device. You are using in biology all the time filters. So the principle of filtration is you pour something from the top, the big things remain and the small things come out. But imagine a filter in which you have the choice of deciding what size you want to keep inside. A big things are also excluded, smaller things are also excluded. This you can do with ions because they have, um, they are charged particles. So if you apply electric and magnetic fields, you can trap them. And by changing the electric and magnetic fields, you can trap whatever you like. You do not have to understand this very much because they are already there inside the black box of the mass spectrometer and you can use the ion trap. So you can keep on fragmenting. But imagine if I took your mug and uh, smashed it and broke it on the ground, it will break into a lot of pieces. But I did this after sending you out of the room. And then I call you back inside and say, now you tell me what I have broken. What you will do, you will start putting them all back together and try to find which object have I broken. If it is shattered completely, you will not be able to tell me what object is broken. But if there are some few pieces, you will put it all back together. So it is exactly like doing a jigsaw puzzle where you have pieces and you have to make the picture. That is structure determination. That is what today you do with free, see, if you are sequencing proteins, that is what you really do. Uh, collecting the pieces, then putting the pieces back together to get the structure of the whole molecule. And biologically this has incredible potential because post-translational modifications, anything you want. After all, what is chemistry? In chemistry, you are either adding some atom or you are removing some atom. So you are doing something. The result of this is that always you will be adding mass or removing mass. So the starting molecule and the ending molecule will now both have different masses. So if you have a method which can just weigh them, then you are in business. And uh, that is why mass spectrometry is becoming so rapidly a uh, routine part of uh, analytical biochemistry laboratories. Yeah, there is absolutely no, uh, no problem in this because you know you just look at your at proteins. Uh, what do they have? Uh, what are the groups in proteins? You can have uh, lysine K, arginine R, histidine H. These are all now positive because they are basic residues. They will accept a proton and become positively charged. Look at the two acidic residues, aspartic acid, glutamic acid. They are acids. They will give up a proton and become negatively charged. So if I now work at a pH at which all the carboxylates are uh, negative, all I have to, because I do not care what charge I have here at the bottom, so I only need a charge. So one mode is negative ion mass spectrometry and the other mode is positive ion mass spectrometry. By and large, most of the time you use positive ion mass spectrometry. But you can change the pH of biological solutions and work is negative. Nucleic acids very often are better to work with negative ion mass spectrometry because the backbone is full of phosphate. Sir, can we determine protein-protein interaction by mass spectrometry? Yes, you can. Uh, in fact, that is what I think is a very important current area in which 
Because if you ionize molecules very softly and very gently, which is what is in you do that when you have a method called nano spray. Problem with nano spray is that it is very easy to clog the needles through which you spray the solution. But in nano spray mass spectrometry, the molecules are taken very gently into the gas phase, so non covalent interactions remain. So, in this case, you could be in principle measure the mass of the complex, which is what is done when you take the ribosome into the gas phase, because the ribosome is a complex of 58 proteins plus some little bit of nucleic acid. That has to be very gentle, that is why. That is why the droplets that you spray are so small that you do not need to uh, hit it with uh, heated nitrogen gas like this. That is why one, the normal thing that we do is called electro spray, uh, but if you want to be very, very gentle, then we do what is called nano spray. Yeah, so you see, circular dichroism is a method. It is a method which you can apply first to chiral molecules. So, first important requirement is that your molecule should be chiral, and that means the molecules must be optically active. So, if you pass a plane of polarized light through them, that they should be able to rotate the plane of polarized light. Now, what you normally pass in an you most of you would have studied uh, polarimeters. Uh, in college where you actually pass a beam of plane polarized light and it will get rotated by a glucose solution and so forth. Now, imagine that you ask the question what is plane polarized light? Plane polarized light is light which can actually be con which consists of two circularly polarized components. So, one component is rotating like this, the other component is rotating like this. This is circularly polarized light. So, if I, I can show this like this, yeah. So, you circularly polarized light, there are two circularly polarized components of linearly polarized light. Now, what are these, or what is happening when a light wave is propagating through a medium? You have these vectors and they are going like this. One is going like this, the other one is going like this. Now, they pass through a chiral medium. So, you have a light beam, this is polarized light and then you have a solution which contain which has molecules in it. Now, the molecules will interact with this polarized light. What can happen? One is that as the light beam passes through the sample, one the right component or the left component, one of them goes faster than the other. That is the refractive index for the left circularly and the right circularly polarized light not the same. That would be nr not equal to nl. If this is so, what would happen is that one component would be here, the other component would be here. Here the resultant of this would be here, but here the resultant of this would be here. This now is the angle of rotation which you call alpha. So, optical rotation happens when the refractive indices for the left and right circularly polarized light not the same. What else can happen to light? It can get absorbed by the molecule, but it will get absorbed by the molecule only when there is a chromophore. In all your molecules which you are studying, there will be some chromophore or the other, the peptide bond in proteins, aromatic rings or the aromatic amino acids. They will absorb UV visible radiation, UV radiation generally. And once that happens, the next thing is that one component can be big and the other component might become small. Because the extinction coefficient for left circularly and right circularly polarized light will not be the same. The result would then be, now I must use a different color, the result of that would be the emergent beam would no longer be circularly polarized, but the emergent beam would be elliptically polarized. So, this is differential absorption.
what this means is epsilon r not equal to epsilon l where these are the extinction coefficients. This difference is differential dichroic absorption that is why you call it circular dichroism. Differential dichroic if you look at a CD spectrum you will find ellipticity along one axis. This is where the term ellipticity comes from because the emergent beam is now elliptically polarized instead of being circularly polarized. How much is that differential absorption determines the magnitude of the ellipticity and that is all. So, all you need is a chiral molecule, all biological molecules are chiral and you need a CD spectrometer which will allow you to measure this differential microwave. But you need a chromophore for this, that is the most important thing to remember. There is no chromophore, you cannot get a CD spectrum. So, uh, sir, if there is a protein which undergoes a particular conformational change, hmm. uh, if you elicit it by some allosteri or something, then would this, uh, would these parameters change of the electricity or? Yes, uh, very often circular dichroism is used primarily to detect conformational changes without specifying what those conformational changes really are. If you want to study structural changes in detail, then I think the technique is really NMR spectroscopy. But NMR spectroscopy is a much more difficult technique to apply to complex problems. Circular dichroism is what I would call a quick technique, but you always pay a penalty for a quick technique. A quick technique has lower resolution and you can say less in detail. Oh, the nuclear, see the nuclear overhouser effect is uh, really the key parameter in determining the structures of molecules. So, suppose you have a molecule like this and you have another molecule like this. So, you have a hydrogen atom here, a hydrogen atom here, a hydrogen atom there, a hydrogen atom there. The nuclear overhouser effect is a parameter which determines the extent of interaction between these and that is determined by the distance between them. It is a parameter which depends inversely on uh, the sixth power of the distance between the atoms which is a very sensitive technique. So, when you have two hydrogens which are maybe 3 angstrom, 3.5 angstrom or less, you can detect a nuclear overhouse effect. What the effect really is that if you now excite the transition for this hydrogen, you will see a change in intensity on the transition on the other. This is actually a technique by which you label hydrogens based on their spatial proximity. Today you have what is called a two dimensional nuclear overhouse effect spectrum, which is done by clicking on the mouse on a computer and calling a program from a menu and letting the spectrometer do the job, you will get a spectrum which is rich with nuclear overhouse effects. But you can use this distance constraint here now to build a three dimensional geometry of molecules.